So today we're going to start a new series, and it's a different kind of series. The, the last couple series have been focused around specific ideas and topics. This one is too, but I want to prepare you because I believe God wants to do something through this series, and I want you to be prepared for it. We've had a lot of people come and become a part of our family here at Southview over the last 15 months since we reopened the physical campus June of last year. When we did that, we, we knew there was going to be a, a bit of a sea change, right? And in looking around and seeing so many new faces, one of the things that, that God has really impressed on me is the need for us to remember what we're about, why we do what we do the way we do it. So for the next five weeks, what I want to do is I want to drill a little bit deeper into what we call the five Gs. And the five Gs are our method for helping people become more like Jesus, right? If you're a church person, this is what you would think of as a discipleship process, right? But this is how we do it, and we've been doing it this way for years. And what I want to do is invite you into that process from wherever you are. But it has to have a starting point, and that's where I want to start today. Where we're going to start is this idea of reconnecting. A few weeks ago, I was sitting on the bleachers in a gym watching my younger daughter play volleyball. And in this particular gym, the cell signal in there is just abysmal. And as many of you might have imagined, that's what a lot of parents like to do when you know, their kid's not serving. You know, you're surfing, you're reading email, whatever you're doing. And uh, in this place, I, mean, I don't know if it's the structure, the, the construction, whatever it is, the, the signal was just, just abysmal. And every once in a while, I would get one bar. And it, it was nice, because then I could, you know, surf slowly. But then I would get no bars. And I saw something on my phone I have never seen before. And maybe, maybe you've seen it. I, I had not. It was, it was a little icon in the top right. Do you see what it says there? S-O-S. I got a little nervous. I was like, what, what is that? <laughs> SOS, really? <laughs> Yikes. And it turns out this is, this is a method that you can still make emergency calls and, and all of that. But as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about, you know, this, this idea of a connection and how when we're connected, like everything is good, everything is fine. But as we you drop bars and we have fewer and fewer bars, all of a sudden everything gets slower and everything gets harder until we get to a point where we have to fire up an SOS. You ever been there? You ever been there in your life? I mean, sometimes things are great. You got four or five bars, you're good. And sometimes you don't. And sometimes it can even get so low that that's where you are. And I think for the last couple years, more and more people have been there. And maybe that's you. Maybe you've been there too. Maybe you've been firing up an SOS. What I want to do in this particular series is I want us to talk about what it looks like to reconnect. Reconnect first with our Heavenly Father, and then to reconnect with other people. That's what this is going to be about. So today, we're going to start, as we should, with reconnecting with our Heavenly Father. And I'm going to start with the first of the five Gs, and that's the G of grace. Now, grace is something that church people talk about. And if you ask them to define it, one in two might be able to. It's a church word. It's part of the Christianese vocabulary. What does it mean exactly? By the end of the time today, I want you to walk out these doors being able to define it, being able to clearly understand exactly what it is and why it matters. But even more, why it matters for you. I want us to look at a passage in one of the biographies of Jesus that a guy named Matthew wrote. And in the Gospel of Matthew, in chapter 18, Matthew is recording uh, something that happened in Jesus' ministry, and it's so important, and it is so difficult, and as you read it, you may begin to get uncomfortable. And that's okay. I want you to, to sit in that discomfort as we walk through it, because we're going to be there together. Peter is one of Jesus' closest followers. And Peter is, is really one of my favorites because Peter speaks what's on his mind. You, you never have any question what Peter is thinking because Peter will just tell you what he's thinking. 
and sometimes his mouth gets out in front of his brain. Anybody else ever have this particular <laughs> affliction, right? And we can all relate to Peter, and, and I'm, I'm looking at this, this story in, in the life of Jesus, and it begins with Peter. Peter came up and said to Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? How often do I have to forgive my brother? How often do I have to forgive somebody else who sins against me? As many as seven times? Now, we have to have a little background here because if we don't, we're going to miss the importance of this. Peter is not coming up to Jesus and asking this question just because he wants to know the answer. Peter is coming up to Jesus and asking this question because he wants Jesus to warmly commend him. You know why? The rabbis, the religious leaders of the time, taught that if somebody sins against you, you should forgive them up to three times. And that's it. On the fourth time, <laughs> you don't have to anymore. Where would you get such an idea? You get such an idea from an Old Testament book called Amos. Amos is one of my favorite of all the prophets. And in Amos, you will see a, a pattern that is repeated in Amos's prophetic tone. And he will say this, for three sins of Israel and for four. And God will declare something. For three sins of Judah and for four, I will declare something. And the idea here is that the rabbis would say, well, see, God will forgive three, but on the fourth one, God's judgment comes. God will forgive three, but on four, the hammer comes down. And no one can be more gracious than God. So, you're required to forgive three times. And on the fourth one, you don't have to anymore. And it was clear, and it was concise, and everybody understood it. Peter's been listening to Jesus talk about love and forgiveness and mercy and grace, and, and he's like, so, Lord, how often do I have to forgive my brother? How often do I have to forgive somebody who sins against me? As many as seven times. And what, he, what he's expecting, what he wants, is for Jesus to say, well done, Peter, good job, seven. You know, that's more than twice what the religious leaders say. Like, you doubled it and then you added one. Well done. And seven's a good biblical number, number of completeness, well done. Good job. Go Pete. That's not exactly what happened. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. 77 times? What, do I gotta, like, get a chalkboard out and, like, start making tally marks? Like, really? How am I gonna track that? And this is the point. Jesus' point is don't keep score. Don't keep score. Oh. Well, that's not, that's not good. We like to keep score. There's an old country song from many, many decades ago now, right? About a married couple. and They buried the hatchet, but they left the handle sticking out. And that way you always know where to find it when you need it. You want to grab it and pull it back out again. This is what we're good at. We're good at keeping score. I know all the things, and I'm going to remember all the things, and I'm going to know what you did so I can bring it out when I want it. And Jesus is saying, don't keep score. <laughs> what, what do you mean? What do you mean? And, and the point of this, where he's going with this, is teaching Peter a very simple principle. And the principle is don't limit what God will do in you and through you. You're trying to limit that to seven times. The rabbis, the religious leaders are trying to limit that to three times. Don't limit it. God wants to do more in you. God wants to do more through you than you might imagine. Oh, well, why does this matter so much? Why do I care? And this is the story that Jesus is going to tell. He's going to tell a parable. He's going to tell a story. But let me give you the bottom line up front. You have been forgiven more than you can imagine, Peter. You've been forgiven more than you can possibly imagine. Why would you try to keep all that just for yourself? Why would you try to be a reservoir of all that forgiveness and not share any of it? Why would you do that? Jesus is going to tell a story. 
And this is a, a story, that, a parable that Jesus told to, to illustrate a point, a truth. And it is incredibly uncomfortable. And it's one that I don't hear taught a lot. Some of Jesus' stories are taught all the time. Anybody ever hear the story of the prodigal? Right? If you've been in church a while, you've probably heard that 43 times, right? This one is not one that you, is like that. This one's not taught as much. Let's walk through it. Jesus said, Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. Notice the wording here. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to this. This is Jesus illustrated. He said, I'm teaching you something about the kingdom of God. I'm teaching you something about how kingdom life works. I want you to understand the principle here. Right? And, and this is something Jesus talked about the kingdom of God more than anything else. This was the single greatest topic of what he talked about. Because this mattered. He was trying to create culture for this new community. And creating culture is one of the hardest things a leader ever does. Jesus is creating culture for three years among this new community of his followers. And that culture is going to continue on after his death and resurrection and after his ascension. But he's laying the groundwork. He's teaching them what your life should look like, what it should be characterized by. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he began to settle... One was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, talent is a unit of measure uh, of money in this day. Uh, it's a lot of money. Uh, you're talking likely somewhere north of three to four million dollars. This is, this is not a small bill. Well, how on earth do you settle that? This guy doesn't have that kind of money. And since he couldn't pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children, and all that he had in payment to be made. Remember, as we've talked about before, slavery in this day was not racial. It was not based on race. Most slavery in the ancient world was due to economics, right? You couldn't afford to pay what you owed, and so you were sold into slavery, you and your whole family. And so here, obviously we're talking about a Gentile king in Jesus' story because Jewish rulers didn't operate this way. Jesus is teaching them a story from the world around them. So the servant fell on his knees imploring him, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. <laughs> now, that's a little silly, because there's no way if he worked for the rest of his life, he could pay everything. I mean, he's a servant. He's a slave to this king. How is he going to make enough to pay all this? What's the king's response? Out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. I got to tell you, everybody listening to this story the first time Jesus tells it is like, <laughs> I'm sorry, what? I'm sorry, what? No, no. That's not right. Nobody does that. Nobody would do that. I would never do that. Who does that? But so it is. There's two words that are important in this story. Mercy is not giving to someone what they deserve. That's mercy. Grace is giving to someone what they do not deserve. Again, we use these words so often, but it's important to remember the distinction. Mercy, not giving to someone what they deserve. What does this guy deserve, this, this servant of the king? What does he deserve? He deserves exactly what the king was going to do. What does he receive? receives what he doesn't deserve. He receives grace. Wow. How do you respond when you receive grace like that? Like what, what does that do in your life? Does it change anything about you? Does it change how you begin to look at other people? Does it change how you act and think? Let's continue in Jesus' story. When that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. hundred denarii, a couple bucks. Maybe like $15, $20. Seizing him, literally choking him, grabbing him by the throat, 
he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. Now, he's going out from where he has just been forgiven and received that level of grace. And we see this. His fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. Does that sound familiar at all? It's the exact same words that he used in talking to the king just a short while ago. That's going to ring a bell. Wait, I just said that. Oh, wait, what just happened with me? How does he, what does he do? He refused. And he went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. That's an ugly story. Again, not one that's talked about much. What's stressed here is the terrible hypocrisy of one who was forgiven so much but chose not to forgive someone else. When it says he refused to listen to the pleading of his fellow servant, what, what it says there literally is he chose not to. He chose not to. I will not listen to them. I will not pay attention to them. And that's what Jesus' story is about. It's about this hypocrisy. But we're not done yet. Jesus goes on. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned them and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant? As I had mercy on you? I mean, really? That's how you're going to respond to somebody else? Based on what I did for you? I don't understand. And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. That's a, it's a, not a good translation there. It's actually delivered him to the torturers, literally. And this is how, again, you know this is a Gentile king because the Jewish rulers did not use torturers. Uh, the Gentiles did. And so you deliver them over to the torturer until basically they pay it out through torture. Uh, can you ever pay out a couple million bucks through torture? No. And so this is going to be a very long, very unhappy, very miserable end. Jesus has one more thing to say. so also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Now, we could have done without that, couldn't we? Jesus, really? <laughs> do you have to drop that right now? Like, really? That is a very uncomfortable verse. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. From your heart, not just faking it till you make it. You got to actually mean it. This is a difficult story. Because what Jesus is teaching is is that if you refuse, if you choose not to forgive, you are excluded from the kingdom of God where the normal pattern of life is forgiveness. You're excluded. You have chosen not to be a part of it by choosing not to live in a kingdom way. And if the forgiven do not forgive, they will be judged by God. This is one of the harder teachings of Jesus. And I wonder if this is not why we don't talk about it more. Because we like the easier stuff. <laughs> Forgiveness and mercy are essential aspects of kingdom life. They're not optional. This is not an optional add-on. This isn't like queso. 
right? Queso is optional. If you like that, that's great. This is like chips and salsa. That's essential. They're absolutely required. Those who refuse to do so will not be shown forgiveness or mercy by God. And you know what? This isn't the only place Jesus ever said this. And that's what makes it harder. Because if it were just one verse, we could try to like rationalize it away and say, well, you know, the original context and the original language, you know, forgiveness actually meant something else. No, it didn't. It really didn't. When Jesus is teaching the disciples how to pray, they come to him and they're like, teach us how to pray. You pray in a way nobody's ever heard. You pray in a way nobody's ever seen. Teach us how to pray. And he's teaching them how to pray. And toward the end of that prayer that he's teaching them, he says this, forgive us our sins, Father, as we also have forgiven those who sin against us. I like that first part. What do you mean I'm asking God to forgive as I have? What if I haven't forgiven? Then guess what? And Jesus keeps teaching them, and he says, lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then he does this little tag on at the end that we don't talk about when we teach people how to pray. We don't talk about the tag on at the end of the prayer that Jesus is teaching the disciples. He says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Oh, well, that's uncomfortable. And we see it again. The Apostle Paul keyed into this in so many of his writings to the early believers. And when he's writing to the church in Ephesus, he said this. He said, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. You. And there it is again. You getting a the theme here? If we choose willfully not to forgive someone else, then we cannot expect forgiveness from God. We cannot receive what we are not willing to give. And this is hard. That that First servant, the the difference in the amount forgiven the first servant versus the second servant, the difference is about 600,000 times as much. 600,000 times as much. So let's let's translate this. God has forgiven me 600,000 times as much. How can I refuse to forgive my brother or sister? You sinned against me. God's forgiven me 600,000 times that much. How, Jesus says, can you refuse to extend what you've received? And so we come to the question that I want to ask you, which is, will we be a conduit of the love and mercy and grace of God, forgiving others as God has forgiven us in Jesus, or will we choose not to? And the fact is, we get to decide. You get to decide. And this is not easy. At all. I struggle with this. Maybe you do too. I've struggled with this my whole life because there are things that people would do or say that hurt, and I don't want to forgive them. They hurt. People hurt. Right? I grew up, and many of you know, if you've been here a while, you've heard me talk about this. My, my parents got divorced when I was a teenager, and it was not amicable at all. Um, split up when I was 15, and they finalized the divorce when I was 26. You know how you make it drag on for 11 years? You keep going back to court over and over and over and over until the only person who has any money left is the lawyers. And that's what happens. What kind of environment does that create? Not one where Love and mercy and forgiveness and grace are foremost in your mind. And I struggle with this. It was so incredibly difficult to learn how to deal with this. 
But I'm not going to tell you I got it right all the time because I didn't. I didn't get it right most of the time. A few years ago, well, a few years ago, I say that like it was like two years ago. Almost a decade ago, um, I went for the first time on an archaeological dig. And on, on a dig, you work for five days and then you have two days off. And in Jordan, the, the days off are Friday and Saturday. Right? And so that was our days off. We worked Sunday through Thursday. And on your days off, you can hang out at the, at the hotel, you can do laundry, um, or they have, like, you can take a day trip to go see something in the country. Well, I always wanted to take the day trips, right? I'll do the laundry at night, that's fine. But I want to go see stuff. And so I went to a place called Macaris. And Macaris is the site of where the, the palace was where Herod had John the Baptizer beheaded. Right? And Macaris is a beautiful, beautiful site. You can see the, the palace was actually on top there. And if you look really close, you can see the pillars that are remaining from the palace on the very top. Now, as you look at this, there's, there's the top. This is the, the ruins from the palace uh, where Herod would have had John beheaded. As you look at this, there's me almost 10 years ago. Uh, look behind me. That's why the picture is there. What do you see? Desert, rocks, yeah. What else? You see water, right? And here's a little better picture, right? That's pretty, isn't it? Now you know why Herod put his palace up there. He had a nice view, right? You know what body of water that is? That's the Dead Sea. That's the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea is called dead. Why? Nothing lives there because the salt content is so high. The Dead Sea is in the southern part of Israel there. It's on the border between Israel and Jordan today. And you can see it in the north, the Sea of Galilee. Uh, the Sea of Galilee is fed even further north of this uh, in a place called Benias. And the snow falls on Mount Hermon. The snow falls, and it becomes the headwaters of the Jordan, flows into the Sea of Galilee, flows down. Here's the Jordan River flowing down, and ultimately ends in the Dead Sea. And in the Dead Sea, there's no outlet. There's only an inlet. So the water comes in, but has no place to go out. Well, in the Dead Sea, in, in the southern part of that part of the world, it's very warm. And if you've ever been there, you know this. It is very, very warm. And you do not want to go there in June or July, which is why our dig, which took place on the northeast corner of the Dead Sea, uh, you do not go there and dig in the summer because, well, you will die. Uh, you go in the winter, our winter, right? So we would go in January, February. And in January, February, the temps are only in the 80s and 90s. So it's not, not so bad, right? But if you go there in the summer, uh, you're going to find 115, 125. Um, for some reason, people tend to collapse in that type of environment. Strange. Uh, so as we use volunteers, that's not something you go, hey, come, collapse. It'll be a lot of fun. Um, so, so I'm there, and, and I, I'm, I'm looking at the Dead Sea most of the time that we're there. You can see it from the dig side. And it looks really pretty. I mean, it's, it's, it's beautiful. And it's dead. Because it has all this inflow and no outflow. And you know what? So many times I can be just like that. I want to receive the grace of God. I want more grace because I need it because I screw up a lot. I need more grace. But if I don't have an outflow, what's going to happen is salty. I'm going to be like the Dead Sea. And nothing's going to live in here. And I'm going to be dead. That's not what I want. That's not what I want for me. And that's not what I want for you. I've talked about this before, but I'll say it again. It's like, it's like our hands. You know, if I, take, if I take my hands and my hands are open, and sometimes I'll pray like this for open hands. You know, when my hands are open, I can receive. And I can also give. What about when my hands are closed? 
can't do either. I cannot receive and I cannot give. And too many people, even some people who say I follow Jesus, are living like this when it comes to grace. Well, I got mine, but I'm not giving you any. I got mine, but I'm not, I'm not extending that to you. We get to choose. We get to choose. Now, I'll say this as well because this, this is important. Sometimes forgiveness is a process demanding a great deal of time and counseling. And I found that to be true for me. Forgiveness is not a light switch that you flip and all of a sudden everything's forgiven, everything's good. No, no. Sometimes it's a process, but it never stops being the goal for a follower of Jesus. Because if it does, that means you're choosing to have it. You're choosing not to forgive. There is a vast difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. You've got to bear that in mind. Forgiveness never stops being the goal for a follower of Jesus. I wanted to start here. I wanted to start talking about grace because I want to ask you two questions. And the two questions are depending on where you are in your relationship with your Heavenly Father. And this is where we'll end today. The first question is this. Have you, you, truly experienced the forgiveness, the grace, and mercy of God? Have you received that for you? That's a choice only you can make. Your parents cannot make it for you, your friends, your spouse. You have to choose that. Have you truly experienced that? Like the first servant who was forgiven so much. Do you know what that feels like? If you have, you say, yeah, I'm there. I've done that. I know what that's like. Then the second question is for you. Is there anyone in your life from whom you are withholding forgiveness? And by withholding, I mean you're choosing. You're deciding. I will not. I refuse. And this is a question that I want you to think about. Because what Jesus teaches us is that if we are recipients of the grace of God, then we have to be willing to extend it. That forgiveness is always the goal. Always. Sometimes it's a process. Sometimes it takes time. Sometimes it takes counseling. Outside help. Absolutely. But it never stops being the goal if you're a follower of Jesus. My question is, have you experienced it? Have you received it? And... Are you being a conduit of it? Has it flown in? And is it flowing out? And if it is, well done. That's what it means to live a life in the kingdom of God. But if, like me, you struggle with one or the other, there's help. See, that's why we're here. That's why this church exists. Sometimes people struggle with the first part, with the receiving, and and they struggle with receiving because they're like, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. That's that's too much. I've I've, I've done too much. I'm too far. I'm too far gone. And to that, I would simply say the first servant was forgiven 10,000 talents. Far beyond what anybody listening had ever seen or experienced in their life. And I think Jesus' point there was to say, you can't do enough to put you beyond the grace of God. No matter where you are, no matter where you've been, he still extends his hand. He's standing with his arms wide open saying, come home. Sometimes it's not so much with the receiving, it's, it's with the giving, but you don't know what they did. You don't know what they said. 
And no, I don't. But I can tell you this. I've experienced stuff. And it's hard. And I'm not telling you this should be easy. Just, you know, tiptoe through the tulips with me and let's flip that light switch and it'll all be done. I mean, that'd be nice. (laughs) That has not been my experience. Sometimes it's a process. But my challenge to you is to take the step. Take the step and don't forget what the goal is. Because Jesus said this is important. As a matter of fact, this couldn't be more important. You want to receive the grace of God? Then you've got to give it. As we start this series, I want you to understand this is what reconnecting with your Heavenly Father looks like. This is where it starts don't get this one right, it doesn't matter if you get all the others right. This one is first on purpose. For a reason. 